So here's our agenda for the day. Um, we will be covering some general information about OAC and its strategic plan, our new online granting system, as well as the new music program redesign, uh, and give, as well as give some specific information about these new music programs, um, discussions about how assessment um, has worked and will continue to work, and then turn it over to you for any questions that you might have. So OAC's strategic plan, uh, Vital Arts and Public Value, was developed through community consultations and feedback. We had over 2,000 respondents to an online questionnaire, as well as environmental scan and selected focus groups. We completed our strategic plan in October 2014, and the results have been made public and are available for your viewing the full detail. But some of the highlights that are important in the context, particularly of our project programs, um, we'll talk about in today. So the, in addition to services to the arts community and to the public of Ontario, the OAC strategic plan also includes a commitment to our own administrative effectiveness in delivery of programs and cost containment. So the new NOVA online system for applications, as well as OAC's move to our new office space um, in 2016, are all part of our effective management of resources. As well, coming out of the strategic plan are action items for its implementation. For example, we have identified four streams of activity that are of particular interest to us. Creating and presenting, building audiences and markets, engaging communities and schools, and developing careers and arts services. The music-specific programs fall under the creating and presenting stream. However, there may be granting programs and other streams that may be of interest to composers and musicians. Some of these we'll uh, refer to later on. The changes we have made to the music and other granting programs are to better deliver on these four streams, as well as to work effectively within the new NOVA environment. We've been asked already whether these changes are the tail wagging the dog, in other words, due to technology requirements or vice versa? And the simple answer is both. We have been looking for potential program redesigns, including in the music section, since approximately 2008, as a means to deliver actions on the latest strategic plan. Of course, the requirements of the online granting system simply made this more imperative in the short term. Creating and maintaining the existing number of programs in NOVA would have proved both costly and unmanageable. I will speak more about the online application in a few minutes. It is important to add here that the plan states that OAC has identified strategies that will support existing artists and arts organizations who continue to be active and vital contributors, and at the same time, nourish emerging artists and arts organizations, and support new ways of working, creating, producing, and presenting art. The program design is intended to do just that. Another reality of OAC at the moment is that we are now entering the ninth consecutive year with no new money. That has uh, given us enormous amount of pressure to respond to increasing demand. Some of our challenges, uh, some of our changes, sorry, also enable us to manage this as well. The OAC plan also identifies the following list of priority groups. Artists of color, deaf artists and artists with disabilities, francophone artists, indigenous artists, new generation artists, meaning between the ages of 18 and 30, and artists living in regions outside of Toronto proper. Some of these priority groups have been in place for many years and some are newer additions. There have also been a few refinements in the wording and definitions of these priority groups. Some have been identified as they are groups that have faced systemic barriers where others articulate our mandate to serve all of Ontario. We'll talk a bit later about what these mean in the context of assessing project grant applications.
Oh, you can still see the webcam. Okay, how do I turn that off? How's that? Yeah, it seems like you're off now. Okay, thank you. So, um, before we get to the new online system, Nova, I just wanted to note that part of this online move uh, that OAC has launched, that OAC has also launched uh, a revamped website as well. You can search for applications in a few different ways, including by discipline and the four streams of activity that I noted earlier. We are planning to have more information and resources available on the site as the system develops. Information on all our new granting programs have been posted on this new site uh, since December 2016. So now for the good news, as, as was alluded to earlier, no more paper applications and multiple copies and running to the mailbox. Um, as noted here, all applications are online as of 2017. OAC is one of many granting agencies that is using current technologies to transform the application process. Here are a few key points. There will be a new deadline, deadline time on the deadline day so that OAC staff can be made available for those experience, experiencing technical challenges or who have questions so that we are able to respond and address these as much to the extent possible. So 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time is the new deadline time for our program. But obviously do not wait for the deadline. You definitely want to register early in our NOVA system. Applications will be available approximately two months in advance of a program deadline. That we will go through uh, more detail, the overview of the new deadlines for music project programs further on. Currently in the, uh, on the website, you will see an Apply Now button at the bottom of the page when a program is accepting new applications. Once signed into NOVA, you will see a list of all programs that are open and accepting applications. And here are a few more specifics about the technical aspects of the process. You can certainly start by clicking that Apply Now button on the website to register in NOVA. Be sure to complete and activate your personal profile in NOVA. You can do this step now. You don't need to wait for any programs you are interested in uh, to be open. Note that NOVA will allow you to start an application also without completing your profile, but you won't be able to submit an application and until uh, this has been done. So it's really important to make sure you do that early and don't leave it to the last second, a uh, few minutes before 1 o'clock on the day of the deadline. Make sure you update your profile, activate it um, before you start working on applications. Everyone signs into NOVA as an individual. This is different from many of our other sister agencies, so it's an important note. You can associate yourself with an with organization which you are a part of. If you have affiliation with multiple organizations, you can then select and switch between them to see the information and applications pertaining to each one. For example, a composer who is also an artistic director would log in and create a profile that you could use when applying as an individual, but could also associate yourself and have access to an organizational profile and their applications as well. To do this, there's a tab called Switch Organizations to switch between your personal profiles and profiles of affiliated organizations. Individuals already affiliated with an organization's profile can approve other people to also be affiliated. Note that anybody associated with an organization will have full access to the applications as well as the organization's history in the system. You will be able to update your personal profile uh, and profiles of any organizations with which you are associated, such as updating your mailing address. You will be able to check on the status of applications that are in progress and track, and, and, and track any tasks that have been assigned to you, such as final reports and noting when they are due. 
Applications do not need to be made in one sitting. You can save drafts and return uh, them for later completion. And the system, does, however, this is a very important note, the system does not automatically save. So you do need to remember to save frequently. There is a validate button on applications. Uh, and if you click on it, it checks for completeness of applications and any errors that might exist. So use that often uh, and uh, when you're filling in the application. And um, you, this is really an important tool because now that we're in an online system, the, um, you will not be able to submit an application if there are missing elements or um, incorrect information in your application. So definitely use that. It's there as a tool to help you. Um, so don't be afraid of it. I know the validation word can sometimes be a bit intimidating. It's there as a tool for you. We don't, won't go into a lot more in terms of technical aspects of the application process today. These are more sort of general operational points that I, I've shared with you. There are other tools within the system that can help you. And certainly our staff is also available if you have specific technical questions. Again, don't wait till the last minute. Give yourself lots of time working in a new system, um, especially for things like uploading of support material. This could take you some time to do, and um, it may be a factor not only um, for how long it might take on the side of our system, but also the technology you are using could impact how long some of these activities take. With the streamlining of programs and moving towards online applications, uh, we did begin working with harmonized applications back in 2016. This is effective for building and maintaining the applications from an administrative perspective in NOVA. But it was also an effort to clarify assessment for applicants and assessors alike and ensure that applicants are getting a similar experience and have similar expectations when applying to different programs across the Ontario Arts Council and also to ensure that applicants applying for different programs across the OEC are being treated as equitably as possible. A brief note on the assessment process through NOVA. Assessors will also use an online portal to review the applications, including the required support materials. We are eliminating those paper copies, which also means we'll not be uh, shipping those to assessors as we did in the past. And this moves us to what the programming has meant in the context, the new program design has meant in the context of our music program. So we have moved and made some significant moves, particularly in the music section, from 11 programs with 14 deadlines being merged into eight programs, oh, sorry, four programs with eight deadlines. Each program, therefore, having two deadlines available. So here's the uh, view of the 2016-17 structure and the move to the 2017-18 structure. Well, there is a merge and apparent reduction in the overall number of programs. The same types of activity is being supported as before. We are not reducing the types of projects or the nature of the activity we can fund. The three streams of project grants support are live music performance, music creation, and recording. In fact, the new streamlined music program based, is based on the kind of activity that was supported as opposed to the type of arts organization or specific music genre. There are, are, will also be increased access um, through more deadlines available in many cases. All, as all programs will have two deadlines, uh, whereas some of the former project <coughs> programs, uh, including the music commissioning one, only had one deadline available in the past. We'll also say a bit more about some of the other project programs outside the music section near the end of the presentation. Some of these might be very beneficial to composers and performers of new music. For most project programs at OAC, an applicant can only submit one application per deadline. This is the case for these music programs. Applicants can receive across the OEC up to three project grants per year. 
You can apply for different programs at the same time as long as they're for different projects. Um, and you, but however, if you've applied to three, you must wait until you've received notice that one was unsuccessful before submitting a third application. Same with um, if you have applied for a particular project, you have to wait to see. And if you have not received a grant, then you may apply to the same program or elsewhere for the same project. Now I'll be going into each uh, music program with a little bit more detail. First off, we'll start with music creation projects. Uh, the purpose you see here is to support Ontario-based musicians in creating original music. There, this program has two categories, self-directed creation and music commissioning. From the perspective of uh, classical composers of new music, the self-directed creation is newly available to you, so that's a, a significant change. Note that the composer is, an, is the applicant, even in the case of a commissioning project. This has actually been the case at OEC for quite a while. The commissioner continues to be a required participant in projects where you are applying for the commissioning category. Grant maximums did take into account the Canadian League of Composer rates. So applicants in programs will need to indicate what method they use to determine the request amount. Depending on the project, the Canadian League of Composer rates might be the appropriate one. We are aware also that CLC rates are a minimum. With this new program, we are permitted to request more uh, higher than this rate. However, the request amount and negotiated fee will need to be appropriate for the scope of the work the career stage of a creator, and the occasion of a commission, for example. In other words, a 10-minute chamber piece at, a maximum, at the maximum grant allowable would be unlikely to do well on the viability criteria, for example. Depending on the nature of the work, it may be more appropriate to calculate fees in using a different method other than the CLC rate. Whatever the method used, or uh, and whatever you're referring to, this just needs to be very clearly explained in the application. I'll give you an example of what that $29,000 maximum might look like as a, as a project. So it might be a composer's fee of $22,000 for its work on an opera score. This could also include a $5,000 librettist fee, an associated music copying cost of $2,000. So that might be a scope and size that might be reasonable for a higher grant request. Librettists where applicable are no longer a separate applicant, but are part of the project budget cost. In the past, a librettist could be a co-applicant and would receive a separate check if awarded. Now the composer applicant can include this as part of their budget eligible expenses in addition to their own fees. If awarded, um, the, the uh, composer would be the sole recipient of a grant check. As we are talking about grant amounts, I will speak briefly about the budgets that are required as part of the application. It is possible that a number of lines that you're seeing on our standard budget form do not apply to your creation project. That is fine. It's perfectly okay to leave these blank. These are new standard budget forms that are used by all OEC's activity project programs. OEC is looking for eligible, eligible expenses that you are anticipating and the different sources of revenue that, you are, that are being sought to support the creation of new work. The former expenses will probably include music copying, Electric, uh, electronic studio expenses, composer's ne negotiated fee, a librettist fee, etc. The latter part, the revenues, can include contributions towards the new work creation activity from multiple sources such as sponsors, private patrons, crowdfunding initiatives, and other public funders. In the case of commissions, if you and your commissioner are seeking funds elsewhere, it would be good to include these and to describe them 
in your budget note. Juries often are pleased to see enterprise and initiative on the part of commissioners and composers, and OEC recognizes that you may need to go to other granting agencies either to secure enough for the full negotiated fee or to knock on another door as a different avenue for support because we recognize that not all requests with us will be successful. Program priorities are as follows. Sorry, I get back to the previous slide. So program priorities are as follows. Assisting emerging and established composers and other music creators. Support for new creation in a wide range of music genres and styles. Support for projects that display exceptional creativity in composition and songwriting. Increase the availability of new music created by Ontarians. And activities that contribute to arts education, public participation, community involvement in the arts in Ontario. Note that all genres and music forms are eligible in this new program. Both categories are open to applicants, applicant composers working in all forms and genres of music. We already had a large range, including non-European classical music forms in the music commissioning program, and an equally large range of genres supported in the popular music program's creation category previously. This new program can assist composers and songwriters and other types of music creators in both activity categories. For example, it means that a classical contemporary composer can pursue a project or initiative appropriate to their artistic practice without the necessity of a commissioner. Or alternately, a book festival might want to commission a song cycle from a singer-songwriter. We should add that we also listen to conversations and feedback about how composers are working today. The CLC had a discussion regarding the commissioning paradigm which composers who are working differently, undertaking process-based work or incorporating other media and technology, for example, did not feel that the traditional commissioning model necessarily worked for them. The new program should be very open in this regard. We're still supporting commission partnerships, but are open to other ways of working as well. In our previous programs, there was also increasing confusion or at least more questions from composers and commissioners as to where the music they were developing might best fit, and which one of the two former programs was the right one to apply for. Non-Western classical music practitioners sometimes weren't sure whether they should request support for a new work and, and where they should request support for a new work, and new music for dance, theater, and other genres might not stylistically be easily pigeonholed either. Classical groups wanting to commission in forms such as jazz, multimedia, or with DJs and turntables also weren't sure where their projects fit. Sometimes the genre is almost impossible to define, and more and more composers are busting the boundaries and incorporating influences from many musical sources. This should no longer be a headache for composers or the OAC and, and its assessors. And juries won't have to fret, as they have sometimes in the past, about whether the project or composer's music belongs in a particular program. In this way, we feel that the Music Creation Projects program will be more flexible and more responsive to the changing practices of music creation. a bit more information about the types of projects that can be undertaken in the self-directed creation category. Note, uh, while this is a category that can be used for pure creation time, composers should keep in mind the fact that the designation of the project will be considered as part of the assessment. While a commissioner or partner is not required in this category, Creation projects where there is a plan or hope described for future opportunities for the music that will be developed, or it can be, or it to be heard and experienced by audiences and public down the road, and this would be very important for the jury. The impact of the opportunity that the project 
would bring to the composer is also important here. But so are the plans for that future performance, recording, and other means of disseminating that the work to be created. This also does leave you open to other types of eligible activities, such as consultation and fees towards a, a mentor, for example, and research type work. And now a bit more about the music commissioning category. The strength of this category is the commitment that Ontario audiences will have access to at least one performance of the work by an Ontario composer. Work suitable for young performers and learners is still eligible, although applicant composers and their partner commissioners are still required to make a case for the impact of the proposed project in situations where the performer will not be a professional musician. It is possible to request support for larger scale works such as operas that are already underway, but OAC will not support activity or work on a piece of music that has been done prior to the program deadline. The new work cannot be completed and the world premiere cannot occur until at least four months after the program deadline. This is the same as in the past. And now a bit more about the commissioner and their role. These requirements for the partner commissioner really are not changed significantly from the former music commissioning program. They're very, very much the same. Um, commissions by community organizations are still eligible. Commissions are not restricted in their participation, however. So this is a, a, a change and improvement. They used to be limited to two partnerships. Uh, with applicants within one deadline. Uh, now they are free to um, have multiple um, roles as commissioners in applications at the same deadline. However, applicant composers should keep in mind that they will be competing against projects potentially with the same commissioner if their commissioning partner is involved in multiple projects. The composer as the applicant should discuss this with the commissioning partner and in the, in the event that there are more than one project being submitted. The composer as the applicant is still, however, restricted to one application per deadline, but again has a second deadline now available to them. We continue to recognize the long development time required for projects such as, such as opera and for this reason, plans for a workshop or development phase for the new work should be described in the proposal. It is not expected necessarily that a new opera project can commit to a world premiere and its plans. Commissions from commissioners located outside Ontario continue to be permitted, and the world premiere might occur anywhere. However, it will be important to share information about plans for the first Ontario performance. We'll move on and I'll talk in a bit more detail about the music recording project program. Uh, com composers definitely should be considering this, uh, the opportunity for recording their own music. Recordings can be uh, disseminated in various media, so the eligible costs might include post-production phases such as manufacturing, but might also focus on online platform distribution. It's worth noting that the original works by Ontario and Canadian composers is a priority for this program, which means that artists recording other repertoire can apply but need to be aware that compelling cases have to be made for the inclusion of their music and its role in the project. This means that composers who are considering projects for, um, projects for recording their original music should be very much thinking about the opportunity here to apply for projects with a lineup of participating performers who will uh, perform on that recording. An individual composer or group of compo or collective of composers can take the lead and be the applicant for a project in this category or for this program. Alternately, the applicant could also be an individual performer, group of performers, or music organization. Note that organizations receiving operating support through music organizations operating program 
can no longer seek additional support for recording. However, they could be partner with a composer on a recording or a group of composers. In other words, the composer or group of composers would be the applicant working with one of those operating uh, recipients. Note that only costs related to Ontario-based activity is eligible. So if part of the process is happening elsewhere, you can still apply, but you must show in your budget how these costs will be covered by including other sources of revenue in your budget. Music production and presentation projects is a, our third music program, specific program. The purpose is to support the development and presentation of music by Ontario-based professional musicians. This includes composers. You may apply yourself or uh, groups with whom you are working. You may be a project lead or you might be paid as a participant uh, with another arts organization or group being the lead applicant. In the past, there are programs for production, presentation, and development of music in live a live performance were structured for collectives and ensembles and organizations only. The opportunity for individual artists to take the lead on a performance project, perhaps gathering around them other participating performers and artists, or maybe performing themselves as solo, was not possible in the past. Individuals had to form collectives. This change will remove the hurdle and open up the types of projects we can consider. So big and new individuals can apply, can apply to this program as well. The work could be developed with future destination for public performance. If you are applying to, um, to the category around rehearsal and repertoire development. So it is very much an intent to have a live presentation of the music. Um, that is really key in this particular program or the actual public presentation of, of music. And composers obviously then could apply to produce their own concert of their own music. So that's also a consideration. We'll move now to the assessment of applications. We continue to use the three equally weighted assessment criteria, artistic merit, impact, and viability. The harmonized application questions are in sections that relate to these three criteria. Many of these new questions are based on the information that previous assessors and juries have expressed as being helpful to their assessment. A number of our previous programs, uh, pr sorry, our previous program-specific applications had a more free-form narrative structure that made it more challenging for assessors to find the information they felt they needed to um, address and score the specific criteria. In addition to the questions, artistic examples, supporting documents, and a budget form impact the scoring of these criteria. These three criteria have been used for many years in all our former music project programs, including the music commissioning program. In the case of the music commissioning category of music creation projects, the weighting will be similar to the prior program. Artistic merit, merit focused on the composer, viability focused on the commissioner, and plans for the premiere. Impact is sort of split between the two, the composer, um, between the composer as well as outward to the audience and contribution to the range of music that's available. So it's a bit of an inward looking and outward looking, that impact score. Uh, the, these are similarly split in the impact criterion in the music recording projects. We're balancing how the project will contribute to the development and career of the artist involved and what the recording contributes to uh, the range of those available to the public. So again, that inward looking and that outward looking. Music production and presentation projects is more outward looking in its nature on that um, impact assessment criteria. This is because of the framing of the program's purpose and priorities, which stresses the importance of the Ontario 
Ontario public's access and availability of a wide range of live music. For both categories in the Music Commissioning, impact and viability are naturally impacted somewhat by the artistic merit considerations of a new piece. In other words, will the music contribute in a meaningful way to the music that is available in the broader music context? The Commission's plans for the premiere, including their regular or intended audience, and how they intend to promote this new piece with their public is an important part of this. Impact is also the criterion where OAC assessors can respond to the identified OAC priority group considerations. We have been through a round of the music commissioning program um, and, our most, uh, and most of our other music project programs with a version of the new harmonized application questions. Many applicants were easily able to respond to these and they have been refined further with our learning from 2016 for our 2017 application. Some of the application questions may address what you want to do musically or artistically, whereas others may focus more on audience and the performance of the music. In the case of music creation projects and commissioning, um, there, specifically commissioning, there are aspects in the impact criterion that relate both to the applicant composer and the participating commissioner. In the case of viability, the commissioner's plans for the premiere and their capacity to present and perform the work appropriately will be featured in those answers. There is also a required letter from the commissioner. Some of the answers to questions may be answered through a combination of what is entered in the application itself by the composer and the content included in the commissioner's letter. Be sure to work collaboratively uh, on the context of, in the context of the application to ensure that required content is included in the letter from the commissioner. And the commissioner may also submit, uh, uh, well, or, or rather the, the composer may submit on behalf of the commissioner uh, up to one piece of audiovisual support material with an application for the commissioning category. Where helpful, we have included program-specific writing tips that are visible in the applications themselves below each question to assist applicants. Writing tips are different for the three music project programs and are designed to focus on the type of activity, the activity funded by that particular program and typical questions we are asked. Artistic examples are an important part of the application, so choose these carefully. Although you can upload a full piece, you will, you will only be able to direct assessors to review a limited number of minutes, depending on the program. A few notes about the juries and peer assessment. On our project panels currently, the expertise we have employed includes musicians, singers, composers, conductors, programmers, and arts administrators. We already draw across genres in order to secure the right expertise and to avoid direct conflicts of interest. For example, an orchestra manager has assessed choirs. A new music programmer has assessed opera. A member of a quartet has assessed orchestras. A folk singer has assessed chamber music. A choreographer has assessed new composition projects. We will continue to involve composers, musicians, programmers, and administrators at all stages of their careers and from OAC's priority groups and reflective of the applicants at a particular deadline. Music discipline programs will be assessed by appropriate music assessors, but there will not be separate juries for different music forms or practices. A music creation project jury, for example, will be comprised largely of music creators with potentially some performers of new music included. The juries will be tasked with reviewing and recommending grants to a broader range of music making. They will be given a larger combined budget envelope to do this. This is another way that we are also being cost effective and, re and reserving more money for the art itself. Keep in mind that the readers of the, your, your application in these new programs may be musicians and composers 
from a broader range of practices. So appropriate level of detail regarding your artistic practice and musical goals will need to be balanced with big picture answers about the aims of the specific project, your partners, and the intended audiences. As part of this, um, oh, as a point, it will not be an academic jury. There will be music creators and performers with a wide range of music training and background, from apprenticeships through extensive mentoring workshops and other professional development opportunities, to highly formalized music education programs, to less structured or largely non-institutional training. We are continually impressed by the diversity of musical knowledge and range of individual practices, wide range of musical interests, and listening that so many musicians um, bring to the assessment table. Here is a view of our three project programs and their deadlines. So there's a spring and fall deadline for each of our programs noted here. And again, those applications will be open for each of these programs and their deadlines approximately two months before the date noted here. This means a lot more opportunities to seek support for different types of activity or to reapply or apply with a different project. We've noted here a couple of other programs that might be of interest and, and provide some opportunities to composers um, in, in the development of their careers. So certainly we have seen projects that involve um, composers in our multi and inter arts projects program where you might be working in a balanced uh, relationship with someone working in another art form, particularly in the development process. So if it is truly a balance and collaboration of equal weighting, um, that is a program to consider. Professional development grants, uh, there also are a number available at the Ontario Arts Council. Each of them have um, specific things that they are trying to achieve. So uh, research to see what might be most appropriate for you based on the stage of your career and what you intend to uh, do or develop. There obviously might be other programs where you might be eligible, but these are the ones that come immediately to mind of most interest to you. And now I'll turn the floor over to you, and this is your opportunity to ask any questions. Uh, and a reminder again to, to type them in your chat box now. Um, certainly, we are the staff uh, in the music section are available both for any technical issues or very, very specific questions about upcoming projects uh, by phone or by email. So again, the people who work in the music office are myself, uh, popular and world music officer, uh, David Parsons, classical music officer, and Jenny Knox, music program administrator. And we are all happy to answer questions on any of these programs, and we'll defer to others if we do not know the answers. Thank you, Jessica. This is Matthew speaking again from the Canadian Music Centre, and Alicia is also someone who's been monitoring the chat tool and compiling some questions. So Alicia, if, if it's all right with you, maybe I'll ask, I don't know if maybe we go in reverse order, because I have one that uh, kind of pertains to uh, something that came up just recently as far as juries go. Uh, so Jessica, yeah. one question came up in terms of jury members coming from across genres. Uh, our participant asks, what practices are in place to ensure jurors from differing genres understand the needs, practices, norms of other genres? And like they offer the example of folk singers and chamber music. Uh, so I'm not sure if you're able to speak to some of those practices that you have in place to support the jurors. So there's a, a number of things that happen just in terms of the process. So decisions are not made by one person. They are made uh, by a diversity of people. So um, certainly the assessors do bring and share their experience with each other and, and often learn a lot from that experience. Also, um, part of that is the responsibility of David and myself in choosing assessors that have as broad a range as possible. 
So for example, we often have included in the past, this is not new, we, we, we do have, uh, we have had our presenter producer project program and our presenter producer operating program in the past that have been extremely diverse and covered this full range of music genres. So this is not something that is new to us. Um, but we definitely look and, and consider in our, uh, our, our assess assessor selection um, what uh, practices people are familiar with. So um, often we will have somebody who works as a, in a folk music scene who also has a, as a bass player or a, a, or a fiddler, but who also has experience working in an orchestra, for example. So often we're looking for people with a diverse range of expertise um, on that panel. So that's definitely one way. Um, David and myself uh, as officers are available to answer and, and, and continue to be, this is again not new, to answer specific questions um, that assessors have about a particular genre or discipline and are there um, during the discussion of applications to um, be aware of the conversations that are happening and draw people's attention to areas where there's a sense that um, certain practices are less understood. Um, again, we have a lot of experience doing that because we have had programs that have historically had an extremely broad mix of artistic practices. Um, and, and so that's, that's a continuation for us of what we've, we've already done. Um, it is important if you have very specific uh, ways of working, even within a particular genre, it doesn't mean everybody is working in the same way. It is important to explain that to a jury. And as in the past, it is always uh, important to assume that members of a jury are not familiar with you, are not familiar with um, your particular work uh, and, and what's important to you. So um, as always, you want to give enough specific details um, to, to also help them in that way. So it, it's a shared responsibility, I would say, between um, applicants, uh, what, what you're putting in the application, um, our assessment uh, selection of assessors, and our guiding and answering and being responsive during the assessment process. Um, also, collectively, those, again, those decisions are made um, in an assessment meeting, whether it's virtual or in-house. And um, if uh, myself or David are noticing certain trends that we find worrisome or are getting a sense that there's an underrepresentation from particular genres in uh, a certain area, then we definitely draw the jury's attention to that and make sure that if that's happening, there's a reason behind it. Um, the, those particular group of applications were less strong or less clear rather than um, a bias towards a particular genre or way of working. Okay, thanks, Jessica. And maybe just a, a quick general question because someone asked a follow-up privately. Uh, in terms of people becoming jurors or assessors, is that something that uh, comes through an invitation from an OAC person or do individuals identify themselves as being interested in serving as assessors with the OAC? Right. Individuals at any time can, can let us know that they are interested. There's a spot right on the website uh, to, to do so if you want that information to be more broadly available because we have a lot of uh, multidisciplinary programs where music um, expertise are often required, such as our touring programs, et cetera. Um, so you can use that tool and you can also uh, um, send David or I and I uh, an email showing your interest. Um, do tell us a bit more about yourself, um, not necessarily specifically uh, what you do now, but some history about what you may have done in the past and the broad range of things you listen to, participate in, um, so that we can good, get a good sense of when you might be a good fit for uh, a program. Um, we also have, uh, you know, uh, are familiar with community and, and uh, for a particular deadline, we ultimately um, make the decisions about who to invite 
to participate based on the applications that have come in at a particular deadline, um, and obviously people's availability and ensuring that there's no direct conflicts of interest all are part of that. And ultimately, that group of panelists is approved by our Director of Granting and our CEO as well. Okay. Thank you. Jessica? Yes. Thank you very much for the, these detailed answers. I just have a follow-up to the question that was before this question uh, uh, regarding the, the cross-disciplinary um, uh, learning experiences of the juries of the, mm -hmm. and the jurors. Um, will there be explicit language in the, in the commissioning grant referring to CLC rates and directing composers to composition.org to view the rates as there um, was in the past? Right. So there, it, it's not a requirement. However, in the writing tips for that particular program, um, there is reference uh, that uh, to the CLC rates and a note that for many projects that might be appropriate. Um, but again, there are, we're already, even people coming to the music commissioning program in the past, some, some projects that didn't easily fit into those rates. So it's not a requirement. Um, and probably people coming from other forms um, that may or may not make sense to them. It, also, we've all, always had um, included non-European classical music in our commissioning program, and for them, a lot of those rates never made a lot of sense to what they were trying to do and how they were working. So again, it more flexible, but we're definitely referring people to that as something to consider. Okay, and as long as the jurors are made aware, that if a composer chooses to use those rates because it fits with what they're doing, that it makes sense to the jurors that why they're asking for that amount of money. Absolutely. What, like, will the composer have to say, I'm getting these rates from CLC? Or right. will they say, I'm getting these rates from somewhere else? There is a question in the application that specifically talks about how fees are being and, and expenses are being calculated. And in that question, there's a direct reference to the CLC rates. So the applicant is prompted to say, I'm using CLC rates, or I'm using CLC rates, but I'm a senior artist, or this is a particularly uh, big project, and I'm asking more than that. But it, there's a question that directs them to say exactly that. Excellent. Thank you. Hey there, this is Matthew again. Uh, a, a quick question. Someone asked about travel grant availability, something that I think the Canada Council is trying to bolster in their new funding model, but uh, can you speak, Jessica, to whether the OAC has anything in place to support travel with artists? Currently, um, we do support um, travel, or we do have a touring grant, but it is specifically about um, either individual artists or groups and organizations who already have set up um, a number of um, uh, number of um, appearances that where there's a commitment to pay the performer from from somebody who's in, inviting them to perform. So um, that is currently what's available. There is also, as I noted uh, on that uh, one of those last slides, there is a national and international residency program that has existed, which is particularly about um, your development. So if you're working with a mentor or you're going to do research in a particular um, area of the world, outside, as long as it's outside of Ontario, that, that type of travel is available. Currently, we don't have other specific uh, travel grants available. We do know that it is something that is being requested and there is a need for it. With our limited budget, we just have not been able to address that because obviously having those types of grants uh, available means that that budget would have to come from somewhere. Um, so we've um, not prioritized it as much as some of our other programs um, based on our, our resources we have available. Any other questions? Sorry, this is Matthew again. I have I have a few here. Alicia, did any come your way that you want to prioritize? Um, not specifically. Okay. Um, I had some questions, but you go ahead with the ones that you've been forwarded okay. from. Okay. All right. So someone wanted to verify. Uh, 
would music that is written for or at rather a summer festival would that be categorized as personal development or commission so just as far as the uh, nature of the creative process at a summer festival but where, where would that fall you can make a choice that that's the beauty of this program is you can now make a choice and say I am taking the lead in making the decisions around this and I'm going to apply for self-directed creation because this is a project that's important to me or um, more often than not in the case where a commissioner has, spe has specifically sought you for something, you can choose to come to the commissioning category. We're not restricting you. So if it's a smaller commission, even potentially you could come to that self-directed creation category because it has that $5,000 max. So it depends the involvement between you and the commissioner. We leave that open to a certain extent. And you're right, there is a bit of a blurry line. And we're not so worried about it. Um, but we're more worried about it in the context of a commissioning, uh, someone applying to the commissioning category specifically does have to have that letter of support, um, does have to have a lot more detail uh, around the role of that commissioner and, and their commitment to this project. Yeah. Great. Uh, we had an, another question from a participant, just uh, asked, actually a couple people hitting on this as far as clarity around the deadlines of projects versus deadlines of commissioning apps. Um, and, and I'm wondering if uh, for our purposes, if you can scroll back, yes, to this slide. And so just, uh, I guess, uh, a, a, a rephrase of that question is, when is the earliest a project can be completed after the application deadline? If you can also speak to that point. Great. So for all these programs, your activity cannot be completed until four months after the deadline. So if you apply, for example, to the music creation project category at the April 20th deadline, uh, you'd be waiting May, June, July, and August 20th would be the earliest that you could complete the work on your composition and have an Ontario uh, or, or a, a premiere of that work. So no earlier than April 20th. Uh, sorry, uh, August 20th. So no earlier than August 20th if you applied to that April 20th deadline. Um, similarly, for music production and presentation projects, again, some of that developmental work can happen between the deadline and when you hear uh, the results uh, four months after the deadline. But public activity where you would need to acknowledge OAC would have to happen four months later. So in the case of music production and presentation projects, at that April deadline, you'd be looking at public activity happening after August 4th. Okay. All right. Terrific. And now we had a, a, a trio of questions coming from one of the participants. So I'll, I'll just kind of feed them to you one at a time, though. Uh, someone asks, does it, hinders, does it hinder one's chances at receiving a grant if you have been denied by the OAC in the past? No. So um, each deadline is a separate competition. We never share results from previous deadlines with current assessors, and we are always using different assessors for our applications. There is so much music activity and so many amazing musicians uh, in, in Ontario that we very infrequently use the same assessor again. And if we do, it's often for a different project and like 10 years later. So from that perspective, um, you're, you're not carrying your history with you. Um, certainly, if you note past uh, grants as part of your bio and your own personal history, you can certainly feel free to do that. But not having received a grant um, has no bearing on that particular competition. And each competition is different. Because there is an open application process, we may have different volumes of applications at different deadlines, and we may have had a different budget envelope available at those different deadlines. So it really bears, it has no bearing on your chances. Okay. All right. Uh, and connected to that, um, for these programs, things like the residencies and professional development grants, are these viable for composers without a formal education? Is there the option to submit a portfolio in lieu of having a university degree? If you can just uh, reassure folks on that front. Uh, absolutely. In fact, for any of our, our, our definition in general across the OEC for professional artists is somebody who has gone through initial training, whether that be uh, formal or more informal, more self-taught, and that is seeking opportunities for payment for their art. 
um, and is recognized by others in their community as being professional. So that's our standard definition across the OEP of a professional artist. Certainly, um, off the top of my head, I can certainly think of projects that have been funded in most of those programs I referenced um, for professional development seen here. Um, I, we, we've seen musicians uh, and, and composers being funded in all of these at various times. Okay, uh, a, a bit of a follow-up question. I'm doubling back. Uh, someone was asking, apart from knowing that the minimum, or the, sorry, the earliest that something can be completed after the deadline is four months, is there a maximum? Is there a point at which the composer needs to complete the project uh, after having received approval uh, or grant funding? Yeah, uh, our standard across the OEC, or the expectation is um, that after hearing grant results, to be notified, um, most projects will be completed within two years of receiving uh, that that, uh, that notification. Um, there is your your final report date is calculated based on when you told us your project was finished. So if there's changes to that, or actually large changes to the scope of your project, you would need to speak to myself or David um, to uh, and get, and get approval for changes to that, and that might mean changing when you're reported to. So the project is delayed, it's going to take us another six months. Usually that's fine, especially if it's within that two years, and those are things that myself and David can approve. Anything beyond that two years is uh, something that we have to request on your behalf, make a request to our directors to get their approval. Um, usually that's an exception, you know, it, it, they definitely do do that, um, and usually, you know, these are unforeseen delays, and you still have the intent to complete a project, and that that's a possibility. Um, the other thing to note is if if you have an overdue report, so if you have not told us that your project dates have changed and your report is overdue, or you haven't completed it yet and haven't been in communication with us, and so your final report is overdue, that will prevent you from coming in for, uh, for further applications. So it is important to keep us up to date if there are changes and to be prompt with submitting final reports. Terrific. So we have we had a few questions relating to recording, so I'll, I'll run through those now. Uh, so there was a question about formats that aren't full albums or demo EPs uh, or an interdisciplinary art project that uh, has like a digital recording as part of the product. So uh, I guess just talking about w what is eligible and when something might become like a media art project, uh, like this question also extended to whether for, for full albums you can allow various formats like CD, cassette tape, LP, thumb drive, digital release, card printing, other. So can you speak to those kind of like interdisciplinary art objects uh, that have digital recordings and then the formats for uh, albums? Right. So this is a music specific program, so the focus is the music. We, we do anticipate that it will be distributed in a music format. It could be something that also has a life elsewhere. Um, so often opera projects, for example, there might a video might be a component of that or there, there it might be a, a dual set, for example, um, and multidisciplinary projects we have seen. When it's coming to the point where it is truly a multidisciplinary project, uh, the multi and inter arts projects that I have noted on the screen is probably the more appropriate place to bring it. Or if the if the lead or main impetus of a project is someone working in another discipline, um, they it might make sense that they apply within their discipline, and you would be paid through through them through that grant. So not necessarily directly receiving a a. Uh, uh, a grant. So those are different options and it really depends where you are in the spectrum and if you're not sure and need to talk that out with us, certainly we can do so. Um, formats that are available, you can, if you thought of it, we've funded it. So definitely we've funded lots of LPs in the recent, in recent history, lots of online only um, uh, releases. We have definitions for a lot of these things on, on our web pages. So if you're not quite sure, you can read those definitions in full detail to get a better sense of where you might fit between a full-length album and a demo EP. 
the demo EPs are, are meant for the shorter length projects, whether they be uh, released in a single as a single entity or as individual pieces, um, that is all fine. For that full-length album, we are really looking for a, more of a traditional full-length album, although your means of distribution um, are, are wide open. Okay. Hope so, I hope I answered all those, those various elements. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that what I might have to say to folks who are joining now, uh, if you have lots of follow-up questions and further clarification, that it seems likely just based on the volume of questions we're getting, to direct those to Jessica and or David by email after the session, but we'll try and get to everything uh, now. Uh, so we, we have another question, uh, just again extending the uh, recording project, or recording question. If someone's project involves composing a piece and then recording a soundtrack, uh, is it better to apply to the music creation program or the music recording program or both? Is there a way that these two should be melded under one? So maybe you can speak to how people should prioritize the application when there are these two components, the creation and recording. So when we're talking about projects, we're talking about projects that fit specifically into the areas that are funded by our specific programs. You and how you're working may have a bigger vision of what your project is. So you want to come to the program that's appropriate for the various activities. Maybe that's one program, maybe that's two programs. Maybe the timing works or doesn't work for being able to come to two programs. So those are all decisions you need to make. For the purposes of coming to, so you definitely can come for creation um, to that music creation program and then uh, submit an application to the music recording for that next phase of your of your larger project. That is perfectly fine. Again, a reminder that you have the maximum of three project programs, uh, uh, pro sorry, project grants across all the OAC. So make those decisions appropriately. Um, the other factor definitely could be timing. Uh, certainly when you're applying for something like the full length category um, in the music recording project program, the assumption is that you are ready to go or fairly close to being ready to go. So if you still haven't composed all the music, it's not that you're not eligible, but your chances are a lot less because um, based on our history of our previous programs, we anticipate that that many of our programs will continue to be very competitive. So you, you really do have to have enough information to convince the jury that you're ready to go on a project. So although they might like what you're doing artistically, if there's not enough in place that, uh, that uh, and music isn't yet completed or, or close to completion in terms of the composition, that could impact um, your chances in a music recording uh, project program. All right, thank you. So uh, an another participant asks whether there are resources for viewing examples of successful grants or project proposals, and if you can speak also to the opportunities to get feedback on unsuccessful submissions that are submitted to the OAC. Right. Um, so we do not provide samples. Um, we've been asked this many times. It is very hard to do that because of the scope and the nature of projects that we find is so enormous. So it can really throw you off if you're looking at something of a very, very different scope um, than what you're working on. Again, some of our reasons for redesigning and, and harmonizing those applications are trying to address the questions that get asked and have historically been asked by assessors and that they feel they need to affect. Um, so that's the mechanism we're using. Um, we are going to continue, as I mentioned earlier, to add as resources as we're able to create create them to be available on our website. Um, so definitely there's more information about, detailed information about assessment processes in general at OAC, um, and, and uh, we will continue to add resources and hope to create some music specific ones, uh, especially around our new programs in future, although those won't be immediate. Um, the second half of that question was feedback, right? So um, all the music programs currently do provide feedback to applications, both successful and not successful. Even if you're successful, it doesn't mean that there aren't comments that uh, would be helpful to you in future uh, for future applications or for um, 
or specific comments about your current project that you may not have thought of. So you can certainly uh, speak to uh, myself or David if um, in that case. And, and certainly if you are unsuccessful, it's definitely worth calling for feedback. Sometimes we have a significant amount of information to give. Sometimes we have very little. And some of this is dependent on the number of applications and the, and the success rate of a program. So in a program with a very low success rate, so for example, in the past, historically, our popular music program has often only been um, a 14 to 20% success rate. There's always a lot more strong applications that the jury really doesn't have anything bad to say about them or any particular questions about um, that, are, that don't receive funding. And so often in cases like that, we may have limited feedback. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of trying again, different group of applicants, a different jury might prioritize your project differently or will likely prioritize your project differently. So there's, there's those natural uh, changes between deadlines. Um, and sometimes there's very specific information and specific uh, comments where a jury didn't quite understand um, uh, what your artistic vision for a project was or had questions about the budget. So it really depends. Sometimes there's very specific feedback we can give you and sometimes very little, but it's always worth calling. And that's part of my and David's role um, to, to do so and to provide that. Do be patient with us, though, because following uh, notices going out, we do get a lot of requests. And so it usually takes us a bit of time to get back to everybody, because those are usually uh, longer conversations. Thank you, Jessica. No problem. Um, I have a question about electroacoustic works. Mm -hmm. um, I'm noticing under the um, the the, pro, um, the program description that electroacoustic works are specified under self-directed creation, but not under commissioning. Does this mean they're ineligible under the commissioning category? No, that is not at all the case. Uh, the why, reason we put it in and noted it in the sorry, let me go there in the self-directed creation in particular is typically we would not fund projects in self-directed creation that involve recording. However, if you're working in, depending on how you're working, um, by your, your creation process may by its very nature include aspects of manipulation and recording. So depending on where you're, where you're at in a project and what you're doing, it may make sense to, to come to different programs. Um, but certainly it is eligible in self-directed creation. It is eligible in commissioning. Um, uh, we're more drawing attention to it in the context of that particular program that, yes, it's eligible here. Yes, we realize that in the creation process it will involve um, audio recording of materials, and that's fine. Once it becomes something that's moving towards an album, that's really where it has to come to um, the music recording program. Okay, I was just confused by the language of the creation process because right. many electric, almost all electric acoustic pieces involve the sampling and manipulation of some kind of recorded material. Right, yeah, exactly. So we're just more flagging, not so much for the self-directed factor, but um, uh, for music creation, it's eligible in music creation and it's eligible in music recording, and it really depends on the particular nature of the project. Okay. All right, so I, I've received a, a few questions that we may not be able to get to before we wrap up, but I, I wanted to ask one that came in. This is, I guess, somewhat project specific, but I think it might uh, appeal to a variety, a variety of people who are joining. So this is from a person who is forming a group so including themselves as a composer, a theater director, uh, and a writer librettist, and they wanted to create a one-woman show or opera. Uh, and so clarifying whether this is something that they should pursue an opera project to develop and create uh, uh, this work, 
or if there are other grants, and again, this is kind of relating again to this, should it be more of an inter-art or interdisciplinary grant that they approach? Uh, what would you suggest? Uh, uh, and I think you've been talking about the ability for people to choose and or self-identify, but in this case, if there is this theater component, this music component, the librettist, and they're wanting mm -hmm. to develop a, a piece, what would you recommend? So opera does get funded in the music section, um, and that's its home and where it belongs. So if it does go to a multi disciplinary program, it might be withdrawn. So it's not, a, by nature, it is multidisciplinary. We do realize that, but it is considered for the purposes of OAC belonging in the music section. So you should be coming to um, the music production and presentation uh, grant for, and there's um, specific categories such as uh, rehearsal and repertoire development for sort of first stage kind of workshops fit there, and if you're developing it further, a second stage workshop, there's a specific category for that in that program, as well as opera to production. So that is really where it lives at the Ontario Arts Council. Okay. If it's starting to go into other disciplines more than opera or music theater, so music theater, for example, does typically get funded in and, and does belong more in our theater program. Uh, so our theater projects program, so if you're more heading in that direction, that's probably a better fit for it. And if it's something that's multidisciplinary but not opera specific, that's when you would want to go to that multi and inter arts project program. So there's still some gray areas, and if you're not sure, uh, speak to us directly, but definitely anything that fits in and that you would define as opera definitely fits in our music programs and could come uh, again, as an individual composer working to to the music creation project um, for recording, definitely we funded recording projects in the past, so that's eligible. And uh, for music production and presentation projects for its development or public presentation. Terrific. And I, so one additional question, maybe we can answer this one quickly before we wrap. Uh, so someone wanting to verify uh, about uh, Ontario composers and Ontario performers taking a piece on tour to other provinces. Uh, and so uh, if you want to speak it, it, to touring and, a, and if a composer is involved in that process um, with an ensemble, let's say. Right. So um, I, the specifics for that program, I I'm somewhat familiar with because I have run that program in the past, although there have been a number of changes um, as there have across the OEC this year, so I won't go into too many specifics, so it's definitely worth looking at the program. Certainly we ha have funded and will continue to fund individual artists and performers as well as collectives and organizations to tour outside of Ontario or within Ontario. So Ontario, our, our touring programs are for Ontario and national and international touring. We, we cover both. Um, typically, hopefully I'm not speaking out of line, most of the time you do require um, a minimum of three stops for it to be considered a tour, except in exceptional circumstances of sort of broader import, such as um, an Olympic, for example. Where, But typically you're looking at a minimum of three stops. Um, certainly we see a lot of um, a lot of music um, applicants to those touring programs. They are multidisciplinary programs, so it's not exclusively music, but just by the nature of how people work in music, we see a lot of applications from, from music folks, and we've certainly funded a lot. Um, definitely when you're touring within Ontario, that impact on the Ontario audience is, is really the lens that the assessors are looking at. Whereas if you're touring nationally and internationally, it is a lot more about um, bringing the best of what Ontario has to offer to a broader audience. Um, so from that perspective, it's important to note, uh, similarly to the music production and presentation projects, that impact score is a lot more outward focused. So it's a lot more of the benefit to the audiences as opposed to the benefit to um, to the artists or group of artists that are touring. By its very nature, uh, touring is going to be beneficial to those artists and to everybody who's coming to that program. Um, so it becomes a lot more outwardly focused about what benefit is that bringing to those that local Ontario uh, Ontario audience or that national and international audience. 